our scripture today will come from 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11, if you want to turn to that. I behave myself. You'll be the first congregation to hear this sermon today. So I just preached as I read the scripture in the other two churches. Uh oh, are you filming already? <laughs> Let's hear the word of the Lord from 1 Peter 5, beginning verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all of your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word today. Who cares? Who cares about you? Who cares about me? Lots of people. And God. God only cares for each and every one of us. Christianity at its very beginning was seen as a Jewish faction. To the middle of the first century, it established itself as being unique from Judaism. In the very beginning of the church, Christians were persecuted for their faith in Jesus. At first, they were persecuted by the Jewish religious authorities such as Saul of Tarsus before his conversion. Later, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians, but Nero in the first century, the Diocletian in the first part of the fourth century. Christians were regularly martyred for proclaiming that Jesus was and is the Son of God. Throughout the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church killed many believers who would not submit to a dogma. Today, in communist and Islamic countries around the world, Christians regularly face persecution and death for their faith. Peter wrote this letter not only to a persecuted church, but to one who struggled with living out his faith. The difficulty many of us face is not necessarily persecution. Most of our struggles come from a failure to remain constantly under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The secret to an effective Christian life is found living in his strength, not in our own, and living under his control and not under self-rule. It is easy to serve our Lord when times are good, and it costs us nothing to hold our faith. But there are times when we grow weary, when we feel defeated, when it seems that the circumstances of life will surely overwhelm us. We've all experienced some of those circumstances happily, where it's just so overwhelming. But don't quit. God will always see us through. It is moments like these that we choose between dealing with life in our own strength or remain dependent on the Spirit of God living within us. As believers, we know that's how we succeed, isn't it? By realizing the strength of God in us will help us. If you find yourself in this situation, take heart. God has a word of encouragement for you. His desire is to use these difficulties to strengthen you, to perfect and establish you, and to demonstrate to you how he wants to care for you. 
And God really does want to care for you. As we look at our passage today, it tells us to be humble. The Greek word for humble here is the passive voice, which could be translated, be humble. In this case, it is the hand of God that is humbling us. We're being instructed to allow God to humble us. To the first readers in the early days, it was persecution that God used to humble them. To you and me, it could be the frustrations of everyday life. Rather than complaining about them, we must submit to the Lordship of Christ. And boy, we like to complain sometimes, don't we? Only when we humble ourselves under God's hand will he exalt us. We must humble ourselves. God uses a variety of things to humble us. Sometimes he uses other people where extra grace is required. Sometimes there are some people that just get under your skin. And yet we need to help them too and love them and pray for them. Sometimes it might be tragedy and loss that humbles us. Even though God may not have sent that calamity your way, he is able to use it for our good. In Romans 8, 28, it says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. All things, including the calamities, including the struggle, they all work together for good. Our problem in our world today is that we don't often accept the sovereignty, the kingship of God in our lives. Too often we live under the illusion of self-rule. We complain, we struggle and squirm. Allowing God to humble us means that we remember that God is in control. Nothing will happen that he is not allowed. When he allows it, he has a purpose for it. And that purpose is always for good. It means accepting all that happens to us without resentment or rebellion against God. And you remember the story of Job, I'm sure, and all that was inflicted upon Job, but yet he maintained his faith. Humility means accepting God's rule instead of ours. It means accepting his rule even when we don't understand. It means accepting his rule when he doesn't give us an explanation. The word humility in the Greek language means to make low, to abase, to make small, or to weaken. It is contrary to our human nature to be made low. It goes against the grain of our pride and our sense of self-worth to allow anyone or anything to weaken us or to make us small. If somebody tries to make you small, you tend to fight back. But in the kingdom of God, your things are different than in the empires of men. The verse immediately before in our text today says that God is opposed to the proud that gives grace to the humble. The rest of verse 6 says that at the proper time God will exalt those who have been humbled. The reason that proper time never seems to be in alignment with our schedule is because as long as we are thinking we should be exalted, we are still nursing our own pride. So the exaltation from God will come when we get over our own ego and surrender ourselves to God. It is not until our pride is dead that God will exalt us. Humility means we lose our pride, but we gain God's favor. When we're humble, we're made low, abased, and come to a sense of our own weakness will be forced to depend upon him. And that's the next thing that we're going to look at from verse 7. We're called to be dependent. Cast all of your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for me. He cares for all of us. 
Whereas pride makes one self-reliant, humility positions us to recognize and accept our dependence upon God. The Greek word translated care or anxiety here is used to express the burden that comes with anxious care and apprehension. Instead of fighting this, we're to turn it back over to the Lord. Because God is sovereign. We are His. And the only things that come into our lives are things that He allows. But we need to surrender all those cares over to Him. In Psalm 55, in verse 22, it says, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He will support you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. The interesting thing about the verse in Psalm 55 is the Hebrew word translated burden means, just like we talked a little bit earlier, what he has given you. A literal translation might be, throw upon the Lord whatever burden he has assigned to you, and he will sustain you as you bear it. He will not allow you to totter. And indeed, we all have burdens, don't we? But God can take care of those burdens, and he will always help us with them. Whereas humility causes us to recognize and to see our own weakness, dependence causes us to recognize and rely upon God's strength. And within the context of what scripture is saying, we're being told that God often allows the difficulties to come our way, to teach us both our weakness and his supernatural strength. One of the problems with much of modern Christianity is that nothing more than a secular self-help philosophy is draped in religious garb. Instead of preaching that we are to see ourselves as nothing and find all that we are in Christ, many are preaching God helps those who help themselves. Well, God is the one who helps us, and we need to trust him. Jesus never structured the purposes of God around themes of self-importance or self-esteem. Not saying, hey, I'm great. Jesus structured around being humble and realizing that God is the great one. He spoke of taking up the cross and laying one's life down for others. Following in the footsteps of one described as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Daily life for Jesus could seldom be described in terms of a purpose that brought no personal problems or freed him from daily spiritual battle. Purpose for Jesus meant facing opposition at every turn, enduring persecution from those closest to him, and finally submitting to the full fury of his father's wrath as he hung publicly before a rude and crude world. Would search of purpose find a place in the bookstores of America? Peter says this to beleaguered and persecuted Christians in our text today. Dependence upon the Lord means that instead of struggling with our cares, nursing our anxieties, and complaining about all that God has allowed us to come into our lives, we're to turn them back over to Him, accepting the truth that He will sustain us because he cares for us. In the midst of these difficulties, in the course of dealing with the trials and tribulations, our scripture tells us we must be alert, sober, and vigilant. And while the Lord wants to use these issues to develop us, the enemy, Satan, would use them to devour us. And so as we look at verse 8, we're told to be alert. That verb translates to be sober, to be vigilant, literally meaning to be mentally calm and alert both at the same time. And when things are hitting hard, it can be a struggle to be mentally calm. But we're called to be mentally calm and ask God to help us to do that. Instead of being anxious, we can be mentally calm when we rely upon God. Because we do have an enemy out there that would use that anxiety to devour us. He'll use those difficult circumstances in our lives to destroy us if we allow him to. The image in our text here is that a hungry lion on the prowl 
looking for someone to devour. The literal meaning of this word translated devour means to consume or to swallow up. And Satan wants to consume your lives. He wants to swallow up your lives in sin and in evilness. Satan is the enemy of all believers. He is the enemy, the eternal enemy of our souls. From the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, Satan has sought to destroy all that God created to be good. Today, he continues to seek to destroy you and to destroy me, to destroy Christianity. How does Satan do that? Well, he does it through temptation. He entices us to act contrary to God's plan and to displease God. Satan cannot have your soul, so he wants your witness. If he cannot have you for eternity, he wants to render you ineffective in the present. Because he knows human nature better than we do. He is an expert at appealing to our fallen nature and our carnal desires. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. Because everything belong, that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with his lust is passing away. But the one who does God's will, us, will remain forever. Satan indeed will use the strong desires we possess to tempt us, to draw us away from God. So we must be sober, we must be vigilant. And those things that would draw us away, it's different from one person to the next. And so we must stay in course. Satan not only uses temptation, but he uses deception. He causes us to believe things about God and ourselves that are not true. Since we always will act on those things that we believe, we must believe what is true. Scripture says the devil is the father of all lies and the deceiver. He will appear as an angel of light. He will get us to do his bidding, make us to think that we are somehow serving God. We have the word of God to lead us down the pathway of righteousness, to be a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. And many people in the world will try to deceive and just tell you that things aren't true, that this isn't really how it happened. But it's a lie. And we must guard against those lies that the world will present us to. Not only does Satan use temptation and deception, he also uses discouragement. He will indeed try to discourage you. He'll try to get you to question whether or not living for Christ is worth it. The psalmist writes, but as for me and my feet, that almost slipped, my steps went astray. For I envied the arrogant, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And Satan will try to discourage you. There are times in life when trouble comes our way. We look at the Gospels and we see how their lives seem to be trouble free. It's these moments that we are tempted to question our faith and to think, boy, these guys down there, they're not serving God and they got life so much better. But well, they have eternal life. We've got the best life ahead of us. And this life isn't so bad either. Don't let Satan tell you that your life is bad to discourage you. This life is pretty good. It's all a matter of our attitude and our faith in God and allowing God to lead us. But the devil loves discouragement. He loves us to get on a self-pity kick take our focus off Christ and onto ourselves. We're totally surrendered to the control of Jesus. We'll not focus on ourselves. We'll not compare ourselves to the person down the street or across the block, but rather on what God wants to do in us and through us. The devil wants to devour us, as the scripture says, like a roaring lion. But instead of giving in to his tricks, his temptations, deceptions, and discouragements, we must resist and remain steadfast. Fourthly, he'll be tenacious. When we've humbled ourselves and found our strength in God, when we've learned the secret of dependence and we remain on our guard against the devil, we can stand our ground. 
And he still will be tenacious and try to get you to break loose. Ephesians 6 tells us to take up the shield of faith. And have you put on the whole armor of God, we'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, but resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And here in 1 Peter 5, we're told to resist the devil steadfastly in our faith. When our faith is strong, when our confidence in God is unshaken, it is then and then alone that we turn the battle over to the Lord. As David stood before Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 47, he said, The battle is the Lord's. In Exodus 14, 14, as Moses and his people stood between the Red Sea and the armies of Pharaoh, Moses told the Israelites, The Lord will fight for you. You must be quiet. Throughout Scripture, whenever God's people stood firm in their faith, God came through. Whether it was Daniel in the lion's den, Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail, when people put their trust in God, he comes through. Resist the devil and stand firm in your faith. God indeed will come through for you. Lastly, we're told to be prepared. Be prepared for persecution that may come. Is it surely going to come? We're not exempt from it. Paul, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, All those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. As Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words to the early church, persecution of Christianity was spreading. But we must stay firm. Be assured. Be assured that God will be with you. Here we have the promise that God accomplishes purpose in us. And as he accomplishes purpose in us, he tells us at the end of our text today that he will perfect us. To perfect us means to bring us to wholeness. Nothing lacking. Complete in every way. He also tells us he will confirm us to make us firm in our faith rather than being uncertain and weak. We'll be resolute and determined in our faith. He will strengthen us. He'll use the difficulties in our lives to make us stronger, to enable us to face anything. And he will establish us. The picture the Greek paints for here as a foundation that is not shaking, but has settled and it's firmly founded. We all go through things in our life. We must remember, who cares? God cares. Sometimes those words seem like you just want to give up. You just don't want to fight. God will do the fighting for you. Just take on the whole armor of God and depend upon Him and humble yourselves before Him. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you. For as we humble ourselves before you, you help us to have victory. As we surrender ourselves totally to you, we're able to conquer the one who walks about as a roaring lion. May you help us to maintain that faith and never to surrender it. In the name of Christ we ask. Amen.